Welcome to First Baptist Church of Walnut Creek. I would like to invite you to open your Bibles to Romans chapter 6. Our scripture reading for today is Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, Certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. As we begin our time in God's Word together, let's ask God for guidance and wisdom. Lord, each time that we come to your Word, we're looking for your insight. We're looking for your help in understanding your truth. So give us that today. Remove the distractions that cloud our minds. We pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow believers, Christians, there are three specific ministries of the Holy Spirit that every Christian should know. For these three ministries are particular to the church. Every believer in Christ has been a recipient of these ministries in the past, is a current beneficiary of these ministries in the present, and will be an inheritor of these ministries in the future. Now these three ministries are identified as the indwelling of the Spirit, the sealing of the Spirit, and the baptism of the Spirit. Sounds very simple. You've got them on your outline. But have you ever wondered what goes on at salvation? Now, on the surface level, people are engaged in speaking, having normal conversations. But I want you to remember back when the Apostle Paul was thrown into the Philippian jail. The jail housed other prisoners who were listening to the conversations of Paul and Silas. And then all of a sudden, while they were talking and having these conversations, an earthquake took place. The building began to shake. And as that was taking place, all of the doors were opened. And the jailer came to see how many people had escaped. Because if you're a prisoner and the jail opens up, you run away. And so when the jailer comes down, he looks and sees none had left. What would cause prisoners to stay in jail after the doors had been opened? The jailer asked, what must he do to be saved? And Paul just responded, you must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That very night, the jailer and everyone in his family became saved, and they rejoiced and they celebrated. As we grow in faith, we learn that there's a whole lot more going on than what we see at the surface level. You see, the Holy Spirit is doing a work, an incredible work, and doing incredible things right below the surface. So today we're going to look below the surface, and we're going to explore those three ministries that the Holy Spirit is actively involved in in doing in salvation. And the first is called the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, or the indwelling of the Spirit, it's often called. So your first point, the indwelling of the Spirit, it may be best seen or best known 
as starting off with just a definition and an explanation so we can follow along in each one of these. And we ask, what is the definition of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is the fulfillment of the promise of Jesus by the Holy Spirit to permanently reside in every believer who trusts in Christ. That seems pretty simple, doesn't it? Instead of going to the temple to visit God, God is now taking up resident inside of the believer. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul meant when he was talking to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19, saying, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not of your own? So let's explain that a little bit further. Let's see how this works in Scripture. Because we may ask, what does it mean to the believer to have the Holy Spirit dwell inside of us? Well, to start off with, we have to know, or we have to understand, that the Holy Spirit is a gift that is given to us without merit. So I'm going to ask you to turn to the Gospel, the Gospel of John. Because this is where Jesus is talking to the disciples, and he's telling them about the Holy Spirit that is going to be given to them. In John chapter 7... Verse 37 through 39, he says, But on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried out, saying, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. And he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom, the, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So Jesus is speaking to them and thinking that, wait a minute, the Holy Spirit's going to come and live in us? So he's talking about something that the people were not quite recognizing. Go to chapter 14. You're in, you're in the Gospel of John. Go to chapter 14. In chapter 14, verse 16, and Jesus says, I will pray to the Father, and he will send you another helper, and he will abide with you forever. Well, that other helper is just like him. The word means that he's talking about, the word gift means to be with somebody. When we talk about the word gift, a gift is something that cannot be earned. It can only be received. This isn't the only passage it talks about that. In 1 Thessalonians 4.8, it says, Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has given us, there's that word again, given us his Holy Spirit. And in 2 Corinthians 1.22, who has sealed us, and we're going to use that again later on, and given us the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Okay. As a guarantee. We're just focusing on this idea that, remember, the Holy Spirit has been given to us. And in 1 John 4.13, it says, By this we know that we abide in Him and He in, and he in us because He has given us His Holy Spirit. We see this over and over again that the Holy Spirit is a gift received by each believer. Given, not earned. The indwelling begins at salvation. In Galatians, the Apostle Paul says, I want to learn this and only this from you. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by works or by the hearing of faith? How did you gain the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? Did you earn it or did you receive it by faith? Writing to another group of believers, he states, In Him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit a, prom a promise. Now, this verse speaks directly of the sealing, and yet it also shows that the Holy Spirit is given to the believer at the moment of belief, not at water baptism, not as a secondary blessing, not as a special event that comes on later on. And therefore, the reverse is also true. And Paul states that to the Romans. If anyone does not have, if anyone is, does not have the Spirit or does, is not a believer in Christ, he doesn't have 
the Holy Spirit residing within him. And he mentions that in Romans. And in Jude, Jude says the same things. If you are devoid of the Holy Spirit, you're not a follower of Christ. So the indwelling shows a connection of a person being a believer and following Christ. The indwelling is also a permanent thing. Throughout the Old Testament, we see that indwelling or when the Holy Spirit came upon a person, it was just for a specific task. It was temporary. But throughout the New Testament, regardless of what someone does, we see that the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is a permanent thing that takes place. And in the book of 1 Corinthians, we see that Christians are, we might say, less than up to par. In chapters 5 and chapter 6, we have believers who are, as Paul quotes, calls them believers, but they're carnal. We have Christians who are taking other Christians to task, suing others. We have immorality that's taking place. And yet, they're still identified as believers. They're identified as Christians. Again, we're just reminded that this is a gift that's given to a person. It's not based upon the quality of their character. That's important for us to recognize. So the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is the believer's security of their salvation. It's a gift that's given to them and it takes place at salvation. It doesn't depend upon how they behave. Daily sin will affect the influence of the, of the Spirit, but it will not remove His presence. So when we talk about the indwelling of the Spirit, that is given to a person and that stays with them permanently. So you can't do something that's going to cause God, in a sense, to say, I am rejecting you, I'm moving out, that's it. So that very first thing, that's important for the believer to know, is that when you became saved and the Holy Spirit took up residence in your life, He is never going to leave you nor forsake you. That's the first thing of the indwelling. The second thing is dealing with the sealing. The sealing is important too. Because in the sealing of the Holy Spirit, the definition of that, when we say, well, what is the sealing of the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the seal that identifies the believer as belonging to God. Let's expand upon that. What do you mean, we belong to God? And what does that mean to the believer? The sealing is God's mark of approval or ownership or authority or responsibility or security. In the Old Testament time, a seal was used to authenticate a document like marriage or a treaty. That seal that was placed on there was showing that this was legitimate. This was genuine. The main idea was to show ownership. Back in the West, and even today it's still used, cattle is branded with a certain seal. And that demonstrates and shows ownership. Now you might not be thinking that we need to be branded. And we are not, a hot iron is not taken to us and burned into us. So everybody can see this. But the Holy Spirit is that seal that's placed upon us. We can't see it, but God sees it. And we are recognized as belonging to God. In the book of Ephesians, Paul brings it out in, in Ephesians 1.13. And we've already talked about this. It says, In Him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit a promise. But later on in the same, same book, towards the end, he says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, whom you have, who you were sealed for the day of redemption. So in other words, look, don't make it difficult for God in your life. Remember, you have been sealed by Him. Why are you making things difficult? You have His mark on you. Don't be dragged through the mud. You have that character. You are precious to him. Thinking of the sealing of the Holy Spirit is sort of like registered mail. Registered mail is, the seal, is sealed by the post office. Oftentimes they use stamps to detect and to protect against tampering. If you've ever see, received registered mail, it looks very official. And you get it and you're like, wow, who's this from? 
Did the president send me a letter? But there's only two people who can break the seal, the sender and the recipient. In our case, the believer, God is the sender and the recipient. He, the one, he's the one doing the sealing, and he's also the only one that can break the seal. And that seal guarantees that you and I will receive everything that God has promised to us. That's why it's so important for us as we read first, or, uh, Ephesians 13, 1, 13, to also follow along and read verse 14 right after it. Because that Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance upon redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. That seal, you say, well, what is the seal? Does that mean God has put a stamp upon us? No. It's the person of the Holy Spirit. That's what He's placed upon us. Therefore, I don't need to go out and get a tattoo that says, Jesus loves me. Therefore, I don't need to mark my body, or I don't need to wear special clothes, or I don't need to wear something to identify me as belonging to God. Now, you can if you want to, I suppose. But God has already placed His mark on you that say you belong to Him. The evidence, if we want to say, I want to show people that I actually belong to Him, is our actions. Because we're told to, and that one characteristic that stands out above all the other characteristics and that we're told to have is holiness. Be holy because I am holy. Be unique. Be special. Be set apart. Okay? So remember, holiness doesn't mean be perfect. Because we, we almost give up. Well, I can't be perfect. But holiness does mean that I can be used and set apart for special things. God does want me to use things in a certain way my hands, as we, if we were to continue on, we've already read 1 through 10 in Romans, but if we were to finish 11 to the end, we find out that Paul is saying, use your hands, use your eyes, use your legs, use your body to the things that bring God honor and glory. Yeah. Use your tongue to honor God. Praise Him with your lips. Praise Him with your hands. Do what's great and honoring to Him. That's holy. I will lift him up. I will do the things that matter to him today, not the things that matter to me. I will focus upon him and him alone because he's my father and I belong to his family and I will demonstrate that that seal is upon me. That's how that works. But all of this that's done, whether it's the indwelling of the, of the, of the Spirit, that's or the sealing of it, all that stuff has been done to us. So the Holy Spirit is the earnest down payment of our coming inheritance. God has only begun His work in us, and we will look forward to His completion of that work. The indwelling of the Spirit and the sealing of the Spirit are constant reminders to the believer of God's connectedness to us. And that's important for us as we study and we look that, wait a minute, God, God has a purpose and a mission for us, and He values us. So we move to our third point, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we're in Romans 6. So if you haven't turned there already yet, let's go to Romans 6. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and this is often confused and misunderstood because people do not have a clear understanding of the body of Christ or the role of the Holy Spirit. And this has led people to think that baptism of the Holy Spirit as a second event in believer's life instead of a primary event. So in Romans 6, we witness the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It says, Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into His death, therefore we were buried with Him through the baptism into His death, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. Now, 
what's the definition? The definition of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is simply just this. The Holy Spirit places the believer into union with Christ. The union is known as the body of Christ. The believer becomes identified with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. This is a fundamental and foundational truth that every believer should understand and grasp. That you and I are seen in our life, positionally this is true, and in practice this is true, that God sees us as being dead to sin, being buried with Christ in the grave, and then being alive with Christ. That is the definition of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So let's explain this a little bit. What does it mean to us? It means that we share the same spiritual condition. In fact, that we all have the same spiritual condition. For all of us have sinned and we all have fallen short of the glory of God. Being justified by His grace through the redemption that is found in Christ Jesus, who set it forth, who was set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith, has provided the opportunity for us to receive the blood of Christ by faith. So the baptism of the Spirit actualizes the truth of our connectedness to Christ or with Christ. So when we, when we go back and we look at this whole thing, found again in Romans 3, when we say, do you not know? Paul is really asking the question, do you not get this? Do you not realize this? Do you not really see the connection that is here? That many of us were baptized. He's not talking about water baptism. He's talking about, he's talking about the spirit baptism. Do you not know at salvation that you were connected to Christ? That when Christ died? on that cross that you were placed in with Him? That God recognized and identified you as such? And that when you were buried, that also is true? And, you, and so when God sees us, He does not account all of our sins that previously we committed? The sins that we did yesterday? The sins that we did in the past? All those sins that we tend to play out in our mind again and again and again? And the sins that we are struggling with in the present, where he says, but I've forgiven you. It's time for you to forgive yourself. It's time for you to forgive others. It's time for you to let go. Yeah. The connection is there. Because the blood of Christ has covered those. And God does not identify and see yours. Instead, he sees what Christ has done. And they're forgiven. And so therefore, when God looks and sees you, and sees you, and sees you, and sees me, if you don't mind me using my glasses, which I do need to see you, all of you, because my sight is so bad, you're all blurry, but then putting on the glasses of the gospel, I can now physically see you literally. And the same thing takes place where God, who has perfect vision, he now sees you through Christ and goes, ah, uh, now, now I see you. And I don't recognize you as sinners anymore. Instead, I see you as righteous as Jesus Christ. So what does that mean? As he sees that. The baptism is a symbol which identifies us with Christ. It's a picture of the reality that's there. The believer is pictured as being dead, buried, and raised from the dead. It's stated in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, as what the Holy Spirit has done. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. Whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, we have all been made to drink, participate of one Spirit. When did this happen? 
This happens at salvation. When you believed into Christ, the Holy Spirit baptizes you. That's that picture that we're going to see here in real baptism, where you are placed in, when you are immersed. There's nothing left of you because you are completely in the death, burial, and resurrection. Now, if we were to stop at verse 5, that would be fantastic. But we move on from verse 5. He says, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Folks, you do not have to give in to the sin nature any longer. You and I do not have to yield to sin. When you feel it scratching on your hearts and saying, hey, let's, let's party. Let's play together. You can say, no. For he who has died has been freed from sin. You are freed from the bondage. You do not have to consent. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. So the position is this. You, are you dead or are you alive? If you're dead, you're dead. So let's move on. Now, if we died with Christ, we should believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no longer. Death no longer has dominion over him. Yeah. For the death that he died, he died to death once and for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. So are we dead or are we alive? Paul takes that position going, we are alive from the from the grave, and we live a newness of life. So how should we behave? How should we act as believers? What should our life now be? Verse 11, he kicks in and says, Likewise, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. So consider, think about this. That's my old life. That's how I used to be. I used to disrespect my mom and dad. I used to tell my mom and dad no when they asked me to do something. I used to tell my boss, no, I don't want to. Okay. But now I'm alive in God, in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, my answer is going to be yes, because the Lord says I should say yes. And because he's given me life, therefore, there we go. First, we've got, this is the battle of the mind. It always takes place here. What am I going to do? I'm not going to let sin control what my body does. I'm not going to let sin be the master of my body. I'm going to, instead, I'm going to decide what I'm going to do. That you should obey its lust thereof. Here's, here's where the action comes in. Do not present, do not consent your members to be instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness. This is the great truth that the Apostle Paul is getting to, to the Roman believers and to us. See who you have been identified with? Now, here's where we come into practice and we put this into practice. You have the Holy Spirit indwelling with you. He's there forever. You've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. That is a permanent thing. You belong to God. That is never going to change. But what if I behave badly? It doesn't matter. You belong to God. In fact, you've been identified with Christ forever and ever because the Holy Spirit has baptized you completely, immersed you into Christ. And water baptism pictures this whole thing. That's why we use this as a memorial. All right. are, you, are you tracking with me? Right. Because this is what Romans 6 is really all about. is identification of picturing what the Holy Spirit has already done with, uh, with the believer. Now, I state all this because it's so important for us. We have been freed from the power of sin. We are free to live for God. 